Okay, so this is a video on matter and its properties. So I've already talked in a previous video um, for biology about matter. Everything um, is made of matter and matter has volume and mass. Volume is the amount of space an object occupies and mass is how much matter is in an object. This is an atom, which is the fundamental building block of matter. And atoms make up elements. Elements are pure substances that are made of only one kind of atom. A compound is a substance that is made from the atoms of two or more elements chemically bonded. And many compounds are molecules, which are a small unit of an element or compound that keeps the properties of the element or compound. There are two kinds of molecules. You have a molecule of an element, which is when you have the same kind of atom and you have a molecule of a compound where you have different elements. So here I've got, um, I have um, two molecules of elements. I have uh, oxygen, which is two oxygen atoms and I have ozone, which is three oxygen atoms but they're both molecules of an element because it's all oxygen. Here on the right hand side, I have a water molecule, which is made of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. They're different types of atoms. So that's a molecule of a compound. So we can uh, assign, <clears throat> excuse me, we can assign properties to matter and a property is a characteristic that defines an entire group of substances and it can be used to classify unknown substances as members of a certain type of group. Excuse me. For example, um, one large group of elements is the metals. And one property of metals is that it can conduct heat well. So if we find an unknown element and we find that it is a good conductor of heat, then we can classify it as a metal. I'm going to skip that. Okay, so we're going to have two different kinds of properties. We have physical properties and chemical properties. So physical property is a characteristic that can be observed or measured without changing the identity of the substance. It describes the substance rather than how the substance can change. Examples of physical properties, uh, melting, boiling, freezing points, um, just the process of melting, um, a co the color, the appearance, um, taste, smell, those kinds of things. Any way that you can describe something without changing it. And we also have a physical change, which is when a substance changes, but it doesn't I change identity, it just changes a state. So in this example, we have ice melting and water boiling, but in both cases, it's still water, it's still H2O, it's just in a different form. So on the left-hand side here, we have solid H2O turning into liquid H2O, and on this side, liquid H2O turning into uh, vapor or gaseous H2O, this is physical, it's still H2O, so it hasn't changed. So if we go from ice to water to steam, all of it is still H2O. So examples of physical changes are any change of state. So we have evaporation, melting, freezing, sublimation, which is changing from a solid straight into a gas. You skip melting, you skip the liquid stage, you go straight from solid to gas. Anytime you order ice cream from Food Panda, um, if you order, I don't know if, I don't think Swenson's does it, but Dairy Queen definitely, they give you these little packages of um, dry ice which is solid carbon dioxide. And if you throw that out into the sun, you'll see that it just turns straight into gas. That is sublimation. Now we know that there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. So I just wanna go quickly through the properties 
of solids. This all should be review. You should have learned all of this somewhere in grades seven to nine. Solids all have a fixed volume and a fixed shape. The atoms are held in a rigid structure. They don't move around, they just vibrate. Liquids have a fixed volume, but they do not have a fixed shape because the atoms are not held as uh, tightly together or as strongly in a solid. So the atoms can slip past each other like a bag of marbles. And that gives liquids the ability to flow, which you see in the animation up in the top right corner. So because they have the ability to flow, because they have the ability to flow, they take the shape of their container, but they still have a fixed volume. Gases do not have a fixed volume and they do not have a fixed shape. This is because the atoms of a gas are very weakly attracted. They also move quickly and randomly, so they fill any container. So that's why they don't have a fixed shape. You can see that cloud of smoke, which just eventually dissipates in the air. There's no fixed shape no fixed volume. There is one more state of matter called plasma, and that makes up most of the universe. It is not the same thing as your plasma TV. That's not the same plasma at all. But real plasma is when you have gas atoms that have so much energy that they basically the electrons get ripped off of the atom. If you think about the three states of matter, how you get from one to the next, how do you turn a solid into a liquid? What do you need? Anybody? Hello? <laughs> Just kidding. You need heat. I was wondering maybe if some of you thought I froze for a minute. Okay, uh, what you need to change a solid into a liquid is heat. What do you need to change a liquid into a gas? You need heat. So to change a gas into plasma, you need huh, heat. Same, same. What the heck? I really can't stand this. Okay, so now we go to chemical properties and chemical changes. Whenever you see the word chemical, whether it relates to a property or to a change, the big clue is that the substance is completely different at the end of the process. You are either describing how a substance turns into something else or you're describing the process of turning into something completely different. So for an example, the ability of charcoal to burn in air. Now a clue word here is burn. Burning always is a chemical change. So the ability of charcoal to burn in air is the property. You're describing how charcoal changes. When you look at charcoal before it's burnt, it's a black solid. And after it's burned, it's ash. It's not the same thing at all anymore. So other examples of chemical change, the or a chemical property, the ability of iron to rust. Rusting is a chemical change. Also, the ability of silver to tarnish. If you have anything silver in your house, like um, silver bowls or silver spoons, silverware. Most silverware that we eat with now is not made from real silver, it's sterling silver. So it's been chemically treated so that it doesn't do this, what you see in the picture. That's called tarnishing. Okay, and chemical change, like I said, the identities of the substances change and new substances are formed. So for example, if I have um, an equation like this, everything that's on the left-hand side of that arrow, those are reactants. Those are the things that are reacting together and everything that's on the right-hand side, we call those the products. So together, this is called a chemical equation. Ooh, I haven't written in so long. 
that's a Q anyway, equation, a chemical equation. This happens to be a word equation because you see the names of the substances written out instead of in their um, chemical formula. The reactants are the substances that react. That's why they're called reactants. And the products are the substances that are formed or produced. They are the product. So for example, carbon plus oxygen yields, which means forms, carbon dioxide. And again, here is a nice word chemical equation. Carbon plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide. So how do we know whether or not a chemical change has happened. There's different pieces of evidence that we can gather to help support the idea that something has happened. Now in science, science is a process. Science is a process that you use in order to gather evidence to support an idea or a, or a hypothesis. The more evidence that you gather that supports your hypothesis, your hypothesis can turn into a model or a theory. And very rarely in science do we actually have laws. There's a handful of laws that we talk about because a law is an absolute truth, like the law of gravity, okay? Very few things in science are laws because there is a huge, um, what do you call it? There's a very, very high bar that is established in order for us to say that something is absolutely unequivocally 100% truth. That's because science is an ongoing process. You think about the things that we thought were true 150 or 200 years ago. I was just doing um, a biology video for grade 12 because they're going to study evolution and things like that. And 200 years ago, we were arguing about whether or not life comes from life or whether there was a, literally they called it a vital life force in the air that just turned non-living things into living things. Not kidding. Um, I don't even really wanna talk about flat earth because apparently, especially in my home country of America, there's just a crap ton of morons that for some reason think the last 500 years of science doesn't matter and we're actually on a flat earth. Just, just ugh, don't even get me started. Anyway, evidence is the point of this slide. So, in picture A, we see acetic acid or um, the main ingredient in vinegar, what makes it sour. You mix it with sodium hydrogen carbonate, which is also called baking soda. You have bubbles are created. I'm sure if when you were a kid and you did a science project of like a volcano, you mix these two things together. So you should have seen it already. If not, go ahead and try it. You can do it in your kitchen. You probably have both vinegar and baking soda in your kitchen, mix them together it creates bubbles. So bubbles are one piece of evidence that can help support an idea that a chemical change has occurred. Bubbles alone are not necessarily enough evidence to be completely convincing that, um, that a chemical change has occurred. But like I said, it's more about building up a big, um, a big case or building up lots of evidence to support the, 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 the idea of the hypothesis. Okay. In, Picture B, when solutions of sodium sulfide and cadmium nitrate are mixed, cadmium sulfide or a solid precipitate forms. A precipitate is a word for an insoluble solid. So you basically have two solutions and you mix them together in a solid forms that cannot dissolve in water. So um, we can actually do this if I ever get to see you guys in person again. Um, this is something that we will do in the lab. It's pretty, pretty cool. This is a very, very good piece of evidence to support the idea of a chemical change. Like I said, bubbles by themselves, meh, it's okay. Precipitation or precipitate being formed, really big convincing argument. Part C, when aluminum, or aluminum, but this is an American book, and when aluminum reacts with iron three oxide in a clay pot, energy is released as heat and light. If you see explosions, fire, sparks, that's a really good indication of <clears throat> a chemical change. And finally, part D, when phenolphthalein is added to ammonia dissolved in water, the color changes from, color, from colorless to pink. This is probably the least convincing argument for uh, a chemical change occurring is color change. Because if I say I take green food dye and I add it to a glass of water and you're like, see, see, color change, color change, color change. Nah, that's not very convincing. 
Um, so I wouldn't just go with color change as like an absolute proof that a chemical change has occurred. So comparing chemical and physical properties. Okay, I'm gonna start on the bottom left. We have, actually, no, no, no. I'm gonna start with the top right because the bottom left is the product. On the right-hand side, those are the reactants. Remember when I talked about reactants and products? So oxygen, we're going to react oxygen and mercury and we're going to form mercury two oxide. But just going through this, comparing chemical and physical properties. For oxygen, physical property, colorless, odorless gas, soluble in water. So colorless and odorless is the color and the smell. Doesn't change the fact that it's oxygen. Soluble in water, soluble just means it's able to dissolve. So if oxygen dissolves in water, it's still oxygen. It's just now inside water. So those are all physical changes. They're not changing the, ident the identity of the substance. Chemical property supports combustion. Excuse me. Combustion means burning. Reacts with many metals. That word react, ding, 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 chemical. For mercury, physical properties, again, we have color, the state that it's in. Um, it says in the solid state, it's ductile and malleable. I'll talk about those later. Cut with a knife. All of those things don't change the fact that it's still mercury. But chemical properties, forms allies with most metals except iron. An alloy is a mixture of two different metals. Combines readily with sulfur at normal com <laughs> combines readily with sulfur at normal temperatures. Reacts that's that react word again. Um, oxidizes oxidizing is another uh, chemical change. The silver tarnishing that I mentioned in a previous slide. Another word for tarnishing is oxidizing, and I'll leave the last one. Um, but that just gives you an idea of the difference between physical and chemical changes. 